All right. Okay. Hello, YouTubers. This is a new session where, you know, my friend Josh McCall and I continue to build a, a, a standardized uh, uh, application for uh, social media uh, uh, platforms where people can, you know, spin up their own instances and be able to communicate with one another, you know, and decentralize, you know, the entire, uh, the entire platform end to end. You know, and, you know, I have to say there's there's a lot of attempts in the market. There's a lot of open source software out there. Uh, we try to take advantage of these things to build standardized open source software, something that anybody could jump in and be able to maintain. There's no magic. There's no uh, 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 mantras or rituals that you have to say to be able to kind of spin up, you know, an instance, just, you know, clone, download, run, deploy, boom, you have a social media platform, go out there and have fun. Josh, we might at some point in time need to talk about identification. Like why what identifies a user in social media X versus Y? The only thing that I could come up with really is uh, the the identifier of the server itself. So wherever that server is from, right? The IP address or the domain name or something, right? Uh, the reason why I'm doing that is because we're trying to avoid the idea of registering services, servers, because if we start saying, let's register the server, that basically means we're going back into centralization. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because you need to have an authority sitting in the middle that's saying who's registered and who's not and all that nonsense, right? And I think, I think Discord might be working this way. Maybe, I'm not sure. So you don't like the idea of like a almost like a crypto uh, a crypto service and stuff. So like you could be on a third party third party um, like wallet or like registry. So it's nothing to do with our service or our social media platform. It would be leveraging a different platform that has nothing to do with social media, but would we could leverage the um, the hashing algorithms or something like that. So is that like well, as far as I understand it, well. crypto. <laughs> Yeah, as far as I understand, blockchain networks work, you know, in a specific way. You basically go and say there are a bunch of wallets, right? Help me understand here. You, there's a bunch of wallets and there's a bunch of transactions, you know, and there's a bunch of people that have copies of these transa transactions. So Josh has this and someone else maybe has a little bit longer transactions because they have more history there. And someone else, this is as far as I understand, uh, blockchain, uh, and, and maybe someone else has something like this, right? So usually people go and find the longest, the one with the more history in it, right? And then they go compare. So if these three blocks are matched, so if you basically have across the board blues, and then you have, you know, uh, you know, these are blues, and then you have maybe reds, and then in here, maybe you have green, and then you have uh, Azure, and pink, you know, this is basically a network. So if one, if someone goes in and says, no, actually this transaction is going like this, this is how you know that this is invalid. Mm -hmm. How far I, am I from blockchain? Sure, I mean, that's, that's when you're comparing your wallets, yep. So this, this is, you know, I don't know how something like that would go on a live stream social media where you have things going all the time you know there might be some mechanism for it i was thinking something more around you know you're basically creating completely separate and independent you know servers sitting away from each other right and every one of these servers think about them as ships in the ocean like literally you're surfing the internet right you are you are in, on the internet. They even say pirates, you know, pirates in the ocean and stuff like that, or the seas. You know, the, you know, let's have you have, let's say you have network one and you have network. I'm not even going to give it any order. I'm just going to say X and Y and, and Z, mm -hmm. and, you know, something just completely network Z, right? So each and every one of these, at the point in time when the server is running, they have an identifier. So maybe this one has like, you know, an IP address, you know, I don't know, something like this, you know, this person has an IP address a little bit different. Maybe they, they are, you know, I don't know, one, 102, you know, uh, 21, whatever. And then you have another server in here that basically has, I don't know, 79, you know, 23, whatever, right? So now, 
at this point of time, if these servers are talking to each other at this point in time, because I don't want registration, I want to keep it simple. You already have an existing infrastructure that says, you know, these ships are in the ocean of the internet. And if you are a user that's registered on this network, let's let's say this is here, this here is Josh. So assuming that these two networks are connected to each other, like network X, Did I write all the networks wrong? Yeah, network, netu, network, <laughs> like this. So assuming that this network is talking to this network, right? It's okay. You can give your, your network a name, but the IP has to be included. So basically, you're going and saying this is, you know, let's call this the engineers, the engineers network, right? Josh Post on this network would appear as follows. It would look like this. It would be like the engineers at, so sorry, Josh at the engineers. And then for additional details, it gets this IP address because you could change the name of your server, whatever you want, but I am capturing your um, interaction at this point in time or your server, whether your server has a dynamic IP address or not, right? And you're basically going and saying, I am connected to this server at this point in time. Now, someone might say, well, why would a server maintain an IP address? Because that's how you maintain the connection because the configuration is literally based on that, right? Now, whether this IP address are, is real or not, or is it over a VPN or, you know, you're somewhere in the middle of the ocean, it does not matter in any way, shape or form because now you are truly how the internet is meant to be no surveillance no you know just free ships just running in the middle of the ocean and you know free source code and people are communicating with each other what do you think about so, that so i had I one one question so I, it makes sense um so one of the things i was thinking about like if, if i send an email back and like back in the the way in the day of like um if i want to make sure that only you can open up that email but you know that it's from me we we can look at like public private key and, and encryption um because if we have ip addresses we could do there's like the you know the network z could pretend that their network x and be a man in the middle attack with mm -hmm. with an ip address mm -hmm. so if you did a public private key encryption um that's one way but then you'd have to publish your, like every time the network X stood up or went to do a post, it would have to basically give you the the the, the post along with like a public key, and then your um your anything that would want to post back or verify would encrypt it with the public key, and then network X could you know uh un or decrypt it with uh, with a private key and stuff. So that that could be the communication uh, mechanism. Um, but if we wanted to have a directory or something that would you'd be able to look up instead of just being able to publish your your public private keys, then that would be kind of like the the blockchain so you'd have like one where you'd have you'd have to know about the the um um the the different services which is kind of like the message boards where you could do public private uh, keys or just rely on the on the ip um or you could have a directory with it which is kind of like blockchain do you like either of those ideas or do you think that we can kind of achieve the same thing with just like ip addresses i think public private key is okay too you know, I think that's okay too. You are right. I haven't thought about this actually. You know, the you know, you have a network that's pretending to be like once this server is down, you know, some other person could compromise the network and take over this and now it's posting, you know, based on this particular kind of uh, uh network and whatnot. So so here's something for you. I wanna maintain I want to maintain the anonymity, you know, over over the internet. That's a very tough problem to solve, right? Like, I mean, you have VPNs and all that. That's great, you know. But also, you have to maintain anonymity. You have to allow people to kind of go and say, you know, I am someone who just walked into a park. Okay, you are just an a, an individual. You just walked into a park where there's a bunch of people, and you joined them, and then you engaged in a conversation, and then you left. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and that would be hard with blockchain because that's the exact opposite of what blockchain is supposed to do. They want to keep all the records, but with public private keys, you could you could actually just spin up the in the instance of the server and the server could in, like you don't a public private key instead of the individual, you could tie it back to the individual. But as long as you're connected to that that network, if you wanted to connect it from one network to another, that we're just talking about from the network to network, you could use a public private key for the actual service. Uh-huh. So no matter if I t- can make a comment on it, you make a comment on it and everything then we would be able to um, have both of our uh, things from one service to the other encrypted with the um, with the key for that service and then it would be able to, the service the service would know that there's no monkey monkeying around in the in the middle I, I think um, that's okay I think I'm okay with that we could do public private keys you know we should do uh, some sort of a proof of concept for this Joshua so we basically need to go and say, you know, I'm going to, here's here's what I want to do. I want to stand up a server, right, literally on my local machine. Like I'm literally sitting on my local machine. And then you are standing, you, you clone the source code and you stand it on your local machine. And then through some configuration, you are able to go and say, you know, uh, here is my, here's my public private keys. You're sending the public key over to the consumer, right? Yep. And, you know, back and forth, you're basically verifying this is really me. So PGP, I think, I think Stolman had also a, his own version of that. I don't know what's it called. Let's take a look. I think Stolman had a version called. Yeah, I think I remember. It's, it's uh, something G, you know, but. Uh... GNU PG. So it's still GPG, but it's called GNU PG. Right, and he's based the GNU Privacy Guard. GNU is a complete and free implementation of Open PGP standard, as defined in RFC. So this is, yeah, I think, I think that's, I think that's okay, and I, and I think this would be a great opportunity to kind of show people, like, you know, how you can use uh, public because because you can use this in GitHub as well. Like, you know, you can actually use this to be able to push verified commits. You know, mm-hmm. to a particular so that's great, right? That's a huge advantage because that basically means anybody could literally go and say, "Any I can pretend to be you easily on GitHub, right?" So as mm-hmm. long, unless this, so let me show you an example. As lo, as as long as this, um, unless you are verified, you can't actually do something like that. Here's a good example for it. So all of these, basically, you'll see some of these. Sometimes I use so if you're using um, if you're using the uh, the uh, uh, get if you're using GitHub directly, it knows that it's you. So it gives you that. Auto- Do you see this little verified in here? Do you see this? Mm-hmm. This is it right there. This basically says this commit was created on GitHub.com and signed with GitHub's verified signature. And I'm assuming this GPG key. This is this is the public key, right, Josh? Yeah, uh, well, it's the idea of that he, yep, yep. Okay, now I wonder if there is like C sharp implementation of PGP. Pretty good privacy. Is that what it stands for? Yep. yep. <laughs> so, so explain it to me a little bit. Like, what is there an authority in the middle? Uh, no, no, your, so the authority is your, so you got your hashing algorithm, your salt, and then your public and private key. So your, your authority is, uh, is your, um, what algorithm that you're using, and then you are the authority. And so, so when you generate, um, uh, a new public private key pair, you pick the algorithm that you're going to run through. And usually that's whatever your, um, whatever tool you're going to use and stuff. Um, you, you, and then you could pick whether you want to salt it or not. So it's a, basically a, a very, uh, a complicated password that you're going to say i'm going to put, put my email my uh name and whatnot and then a password as, as well with a uh salt on it so all those things go into the algorithm out comes a private and public key mm-hmm. so when you encrypt it with your when things are encrypted with your public key they can only be decrypted with your private key so that's the that's the uh huh. The benefit of it and then you can also encrypt it in something with your with your private key and then people can read it with your public key but the the you never want to hand out your private key because it has enough information that you and then people can act as you know as you um but the um 
uh, when when someone encrypts stuff with your public key, you're the only one who can unlock it. Okay, so okay. so you have a file, right? Yep. You use your public key to send this file out there to verify that it's you, right? Yep. But when the data is coming back in, you use that you to decrypt that exact same file. You use your private key to decrypt it. So public yep. for encryption and private for decryption. Absolutely. So you host, you keep your private key private. That's why you want you keep it private. So for the top, for this scenario, if you're sending an email to me, you're on the top level of blue. You're going to encrypt the email with with my public key. With and then your public it, key. Yeah, with my public key, you okay. you always encrypt it with the 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 re the receiver or the recipient's public key. Mm -hmm. Then the recipient can then decrypt it with their private, private key. key. Right. So then, when I want to send an email back to you, I don't encrypt it with the public key because you don't have the private key. So I would need your public key. So you'd have to send me a public key, and then I would encrypt it with your public key. I send the message to you, and then you decrypt it with your private key. So we each have our private keys, which is our master lock, and we give the other person the public key, which is just enough information to encrypt it, but not enough information to decrypt it. Mm. How There's math and white papers around why that is and stuff. But So you hand out your public key because they're public. You keep your private key private because they're private, and you encode the message with the person's Public key, yeah, and only that person can decrypt it. This is how, like, when the like, if you ever watched the uh, Snowden movie or read the book or whatever and stuff, mm -hmm. that first initiation between Snowden and the and the reporters was so tricky because they're like, I want to send you information, but how do I get how do I get your information like a public key? And I, I believe they resulted to um, either I think it was like a flash drive or like an open. Like they had to exchange public keys initially before they could have secure account and communication. And that's the, the trickiest part is because if you don't want anybody to know about it, how do you do so in a secure way? So mm. um, once you put what, what a lot of people like uh, um, uh, uh, Richard Solomon would do, he would, or anybody who wants to have the, their, their email encrypted, what you would do is like, I have like twitter.com or, or, or like, I don't have Twitter. I have Twitter, my username on Twitter, or I have my domain, Joshua McCall. Uh -huh. I would post my public key on a known place like github or twitter yep. or, or yep. my website i would keep my private key private hopefully um but i post that public <laughs> hey key. guys here's my all my keys yeah. <laughs> so now because everybody knows me as a public person if the if you ever want to send me a private email then you could go to my public twitter say here's a link to the my public key sign everything and then send it to me and then in theory in theory hopefully i'm the only one who can who can read it now the, there are things that are like trying to like um crack those keys or whatever and stuff but that's why it says pretty good uh, pr uh pr privacy because or pretty pretty good protection because it would take a supercomputer a long time to crack the, the keys now mm -hmm. but in five ten years everything that's Quantum been encrypted now might be able to be be read openly because the computers will be so much faster. So yeah, hopefully that wasn't too confusing. We, we both need you know, public and private keys, but you would, you would share your public keys. So for a network X and network Y to be able to post back and forth, they would generate keys and then send each other their public keys. And then they are bound by those, those, uh, that kind of, um, transaction so that they know that when they, send and receive messages only that that other one can can uh, can receive it so even if network z tried to get you know man in the middle he doesn't have the the right information and and he can't um impersonate the other person or even if he tried to impersonate it the the messages that he's receiving he can't read because they're encrypted so right so okay so my next question to you is thank you for this by the way this is this is amazing josh uh now my next question to you would be uh, the flow the flow of this to me, how I imagine it would look like this. So I'm going to copy these two servers here and the connection in between them. And you're basically going and saying, Hey, um, how, when, when we establish so both of both of these servers, of course, it's just an ASP.NET core application. So, you know, with blazer and a bunch of things on top. So both of these servers have their own databases, right? Here's how I'm imagining this. You know, the admin on network X want to connect with the admin with the net. So, so people in this network can be able to push data on that network. 
okay mm -hmm. so the request here would look something like here is my uh, network friend a connection so a network is being a friend with another network so this is communities yep. basically and what that would entail it seems like like a requester requester sending a own public key if i'm saying hey i'd like to be friends here's my public key right now if if the receiver agrees then you know a receiver upon upon agreement sends back own public key so this is giving this their public key and this guy is giving this their public key mm -hmm. so so x gives public key y and y responds with public key x right so okay if that's the case then then my question to you would be aren't these public keys available like like anybody could go and say i am pretending to be network x like i'm pretending to be network x right here is my public key i'd like to make a connection with you like let's say network x have been someone else took over and let's call it network uh, uh d right and they're saying hey i am network x actually how do we how do we do that so this i was just going to mention the um your you actually don't have to send them back and forth you could actually just make them public like a open just a open like uh this would be the only endpoint that wouldn't be um protected I know, but, because but, but, you but it's just to help me out this is a request yeah. going back and forth okay hey dude you want to connect with me here's my key give me yours great assume that they're public you can get them from anywhere great now how do we know for sure that someone else isn't stealing the key from that network so you can anybody can steal the uh the um the public key because you can key. you because you can you can sign it with the person's public key because the only person that can read it and they read that message would be the person with the private key so now that we have to but what you're asking is how do i know when um uh network y receives a, a message i'm i know network y can only is the only one that can read it but how do we know that it's it's uh, yeah like for key. instance like for instance you, someone out there is saying hey hassan i'm josh mccall and here's my public key let's establish the connection how do I know you are who you say you are? I'm looking at uh, this is I have to look at my uh, my um, uh, I have to look this up on the, on the diagram because it's been a while since I've looked up these these scenarios. There is a there is a way back and forth that um, but let me look at it real quick. This is the this is where Alice and Bob and uh, and uh, um, what's the third one that always comes in? Alice, Bob, and Eve. Okay. XKCD is probably going to remind me. Can you sign it with your private key and open it with your and be read with your public key? That's what Wikipedia says. Alice so, signs a message, hello, Bob, by appending the original message uh, uh, ver encrypted with her private key. Bob receives both messages and signature. He uses Alice's public key to verify the authentic authenticity of the message that the encrypted copy decrypted using the public key exactly matches the original message. Oh, oh. So, so the message... So wait, you encrypted with your private key. You encrypted with your private key and the receiver is decrypting with your public key. I think it's I think it's verifying with the public key, but it's not decrypting it. I think you can only you can only uh, decrypt with a private key, but you can verify it with the public key. 
So okay. that's so that's how they can go back and forth. But okay. So now um, my question to you is, how do I know it's you? With the verify. So like so evidently. So uh, according to my Wikipedia two second search, I'm going to sign it with my private key. The public key can verify that it was signed by the private key, but can cannot read that message. So now that I know that you you are you sending me the message, I then can send you back a message that you can read by signing it with your public key. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think so. Let's, I'd have to look it up. Okay, so. Okay, so you're signing with your private key and the receiver is um is verifying with your public key right yep you can ver i believe you can verify with the with the public key but i don't know if you can read it um but let's look that up. so else well, you have to be able to read it right somehow right? no it, you, well reading the message and verifying the uh the authenticity is two different things so the um We need to phone a friend. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so it, let's look it up together. So, yeah. <clears throat> so now if I go and say this is, you know, this is, uh, let's see how how does PGP works, right? PGP stands for pretty good privacy. is most often used to sending encrypted messages between two people. It, it works by encrypting a message using a public key. So the encryption happens by using a public key. And we know okay. that part. We just, how do we verify with the private oh, key? That's, oh, 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 tight. That's tied to a specific user. When that user receives that message, they use a private key that's known only to them to decrypt it. So, okay. So I am sending you a message. I'm using your public key to encrypt, not just verify. I'm using your private, I'm using your public key to encrypt. Mm -hmm. And then you are using your private key to verify. Yep. Okay. That will verify and decrypt that the message. Yep. That's that part. Yep. Right. Um, okay. Let's go back here. So there's that part. And then. So the popular files, it's invitation back, blah, blah. And I know that this is widely used. Like you're basically going, okay, let's see. So A is encrypting, right? And this guy is using their private key to decrypt. And then they're sending a response back with the public key of this guy. So public key of this guy is used... No, I don't think that's right, Josh. So user A wants to send user B a private email. User B generates a public generates a public and private key. Okay, so both public and private key as user B's keys. User B keeps the private key and sends back a public key. So user B give user A a public key, right? So that's that first handshake, yep. Right, and then you know, user A encrypts their message using the public key. So this guy is encrypting the message. So this, okay. So by the way, this diagram is as clear as mud, by the way. like <laughs> <laughs> So as clear as I can make it. Don't, don't hurt Luke <laughs> or bother Luke. So anyway, so, <laughs> so, so be shared. That's actually the first step that it would be nice if they put numbers on these pieces. So we know actually which step, you know, that'd be nice, right? So B gave the public key to A, and A used that public key to encrypt the message. So they send the message back. B used their private key to decrypt it, right? So user A encrypts the message in public key. User A sends the private encrypted message. They shouldn't have used private in here. This is now overused. Like this is, I know they mean just a, yeah. A, yeah. just say, Anyway, user B decrypts the message with their private key. Yep. Okay. Now, my question for you is, during that handshake at the beginning, do you see that part where B gave their public key to A? Mm -hmm. How 
How on God's green earth do I know that the person giving me the public key is who they say they are? That's where I have to phone a friend. I have to. I have to and this is where my my trivia is, is uh, failing me. Um, I, I, think, the... I think this is outside of the scope of this mm -hmm. because this is outside of the PGD scope. I think there's ways, um, but I'd have to. I'd have to. I have to look it up. I know I've seen this diagram before, but I, I know that's the that's the uh, hardest part. And I know in the Snowden movie, they made they dramatized that uh, up and stuff. They're like, if they do this part wrong, the whole operation falls apart. And this is the part that's taking the biggest risk. Um, so yeah, so let me look that up, and then next next week we'll we'll call, we'll come back, and then I'll sound smart next week. I, I um. I, I I look like a nervous uh, who wants to be a millionaire contestant this week. Um, but next week I will I will be the phone a friend person. Okay. All right then. <laughs> this is yeah. That's that's okay. And I think I think if it works the way you expect. I personally think this is genuinely. I think it's your responsibility to verify you are talking to who you're talking to. You know, via wherever. Um. I think I think man in the middle is when people go in and say, oh, I am this like. The original handshake, like assume this, like think about it this way. I met you in a public place. So now I know that it's you. You are Josh McCall. And you mm -hmm. went and said, Hassan, here's my private key. Mm -hmm. So this original verification has to happen, must be happening outside of the PGP. It must be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, th this is where like this, th the thing that this helps is um, after the initial handshake and if your IP ch ad address changes or if your, your power doesn't goes matter. down, yeah. stuff, then it doesn't matter. Like if you if you had a, you know, we, we're talking about decentralized uh, network, but at the same time, if there was a, a directory list or that this is where the wallet comes into play, because if 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 your messages were published out, and where they were published to a wallet or somewhere where um, uh, anybody could read from, mm. then you know that Network Y would only be able to read messages that were intended for Network Y because they're mm -hmm. signed with the with the the key, and so that that's where after the initial handshake, then if um, then once the power goes down or IP address changes or whatever and stuff, then you know you can keep sending messages and eventually eventual consistency. Eventually they'll get there, and the only person that can read them is the the uh, the intended recipient. Um, but yeah, let me look it up on the on the first handshake um, how that that would work. Um, uh, so that I don't know if there's we need to have a trusted authority or if we need to have um, something. But at least that we have to we have to lose the man in the middle somehow. Yeah. So here's here's another problem problem for you you know okay how does network why because this is a network to network like this is a peer-to-peer -peer communication right so yeah. there is nothing in the middle that says like once you lose your ip address how do i find you again unless you're using a domain of some kind like you have to use a domain to be yeah. able to run this which is okay i think I think having a domain is not a big problem. If you have a domain, you have an API. If you have an API, you know, it's it's going to be simple to go and say, yeah, the person that's living at that domain, you know, is the network that I want to talk to. And it can be anything. It can be the engineers.com talking to another network that's, you know, the I don't know, the nurses.com versus the workers.com. It doesn't matter, right? So there's that layer, right? So finding that is not a problem. Assuming that it got compromised, I think that's where PGP works great. What do you think about that idea? You're you're uh, <laughs> you're still trying to look it up. Well, well, don't yeah, worry. No, I'm just making a, yeah, I'm just making a note and stuff. I'll I'll come back to it and stuff. But yeah, I think that the um, um, I think that would work. And, and then it just it comes back to where you know, like that. Uh, if you look at a lot of the times the chats and stuff, like I was just looking at when some of the the nerdier the chat you go to, the more options you get. They're like, oh, find us up on on Slack, on Twitter, on IRC, on like whatever, like you know. And, and they're trying to merge the merge the the chat. So sometimes you might want to publish or be able to read your like news feed from multiple different sources and so if we kind of follow that model um you could 
<clears throat> publish one from network to network, but then also uh, like a common like you know here's here's one server that uh, um, that we try we both trust that is a redundancy that we publish our messages to or something and stuff. But maybe that's a uh, down the down the road and stuff. But yeah, it we'd have to have some way to say like my service went down and then you know, like put out a beacon like hey I'm now I'm now over here and I can verify that I'm here because of my my keys. I still have my original keys when even though that service went down, nobody else is going to have my private key so mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. okay okay i i think i think we're up to something here i think this is possible and potentially a way that we can um we can secure the communications between these networks assuming that someone wants to stay on an ip address for whatever yeah. reason right and they want to be able to publish their networks on that ip address then they're gonna have to find a way to um, allow people to send requests back to them. You know, that, you know what would be cool though? Um, if these requests, if every network had like a static queue that it hooks up to, to read the mess incoming and outgoing messages. You know what I mean? So it doesn't matter where you are. Let's go back to this. So it doesn't matter where you are, you are this this network doesn't really care because there's a queue setting up in here. It's like a it's like a PO box, Josh. Hmm. It's like a PO box. Oh, which, this is basically what I was thinking of of having a uh, another a verify. You know, if if the queue, your queue basically is what I was thinking of as like a common wallet because if multiple if multiple services could use a queue the same queue or if if the queues were somehow linked together, mm -hmm. then the um, we could publish to the queue and then only that that network can read the messages that were intended for that network is that where you're going yeah so now you're double secured because only you have access to your po box but even yep. if your PO, po box got compromised someone is going to have to have your private key to be able to decrypt these messages mm -hmm. what do you think about that i like it so do you share po boxes or would you have a different po box is, or is a PO box the queue because it's going to be the connection between the? See, yeah, this is where you're right. You know how are how is your how is your um, your consumer? How are they supposed to know which PO box to put in without having direct access to it? See, that's a good question. So, so do we in during the connection exchange does the receiver of the invitation says, okay, let me sign the connection string of this queue with your public key so only you know how to access it. Yeah, yep. So you're not leaving it out there. You're basically going and saying you have to sign it up. I think that's a great idea. I don't think that's bad at all. So, so you're only you're the only one reading from this. Now, the question is here. I don't know if if service buses or any queue technology gives you the ability to post but not listen. You know what I mean? So let's see. Azure read only. Sorry, write only queue. I don't think that's. Uh, Assign Azure role to access queue data. So what I want basically is a is a way that would say you can post the queue, but you can't read the data in it because these messages yeah. are coming from different places, right? Yeah, and we, we might be kind of overcomplicated and stuff. We might have to think about it a little bit and stuff because I mean, if you think about how computers work now and stuff, the 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 two ways you find something right now is you know the the exact IP address you have, and then you have or you have a domain name and stuff. And so no a domain. Uh, name, which is DNS, domain name uh, service, um, it relies on a network and having a, a, a domain server, which is like, a, you know, a third party that you trust. Like you, you rely on that network to be able to find, you know, when you type in 
my do- my fancy dog.com or whatever and stuff like it, it goes it goes to, through some service to resolve to a um uh now if google decides that they don't want to you know honor that request to go to the site for whatever reason and kind of does a shadow ban then that request doesn't go through so they they are trusting you're trusting that the domain uh so they're trusting a third party deal the opposite of that is like a dark web or or like or just things that are like on the gray web like not completely dark but just like you know basically any any app service that we register with microsoft is not it's not linked to domain name so nobody knows how to find it but you're given a ip address or or just a random name that is not searchable just immediately um so you'd still have to know how to get to it so without having a uh domain name to be able to be searchable and, and find up on on a, a domain name server you have to have either a directory or or something or just have to have that name uh, baked into your bookmarks or whatever and stuff so um I think that the we're kind of back to the fact that if you tie it to a domain name like you originally talked about that we have the whole internet that um that's how the internet works is that we have domain name services so if you have a domain name and you register your 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 uh keys then no matter what ip address you have um you're going to be able to leverage the the um the whole network of dns to be able to get back to you and then you know that you can you can uh talk you know privately with your your encrypted messages going back and forth um Otherwise, um, if you if the domain name goes down, then we have, then we either have to now we're going to the, the how the dark web works or like you know a directory service works, or you just have to have that 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 uh, IP address um, working and stuff. So, um, but let's yeah I'll look up the the initial handshake and stuff. But yeah, the um, I think if we we offshoot if we rely on the the uh, a domain name to get us started, then then we the PGP is still useful because of the fact that we don't have to rely on a static IP address and we can have that communication back and forth. But okay, okay, all right. A lot of homework for us for next week. You know, to kind of you know dig a little bit deeper into this. Ideally, Josh, what I want to do next week is that I want to go and say I want to simulate this, right? So I'm I'm basically gonna you know uh, 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 encrypt a message with with your public key and then i'm going to send it over to you mm-hmm. right and then you're going to decrypt it and then you're going to send me a message with my public key and then you're going to send it back to me right we can get complicated we can get simple you know we need whatever the technology is it needs to come down to something that's simple something mm-hmm. that just works like an appliance okay whatever that is because i don't i'm not building this uh, as uh, open, uh, free social network for uh, for for tickies, for someone who knows what public key is, private key is, I need to click a button and it needs to work, right? Mm-hmm. I need to go and say, okay, here is my, here's how I want to host this, and here's a click. You just click a button and it just boom. You have a social network now, and people can come in and register to your social network. Can I automate this? Can I automate the creation of uh, a social network in a way that's decentralized. I want people to be able to go and say, you know, I actually have a social network. And if you want to join my network, or if you want to post into my network, if you already have one, I think you can take that model on, onto so many different things. Like I want to make it like video hosting services, you know, YouTube, you know, whatever is out there, you can basically have your own network. And then someone else will come in and get and go and say, Hey, here's a collection of all the content from different social media, you know, uh, platforms or social networks are distributed and truly free. What do you think about that idea? Do you think that's a good idea? Yeah, it sounds great. And I think I think we should, you know, we, you said to make it easy and stuff. We ha- we know that uh, apps are out there like Telegram and and uh, and other apps that like when you message, it just says they're doing it for you automatically. Yep. Yeah, so there's other apps that are doing uh, very similar. We just have to figure out, hey, what are they using and how, how are they using it? We'll make it I dead think, simple. And I think these apps are, are saving your private key in the cloud, though, which <laughs> which is another no, problem. Well, we'll, then no. We don't want to do that. We'll, we'll do it better. We'll do it better. We'll do it better. <laughs> Josh McCall, as usual, uh, thank you so much for joining me today. This is a great discussion, something for people to kind of think about and learn about. Uh, I have to tell you, PGP uh gpg you know is is a is is a very um a very foreign topic to me i have i have not used it you know as often so uh, i'm looking forward to learn these things i'm you know for people watching i'm not pretending that i don't know 
PGP. I actually don't know PGP. You know, I know <laughs> of it. I learned about it in college, but uh, I kind of rely on the smart people like Josh McCall to teach me how these things work and hopefully we'll be able to build great technology. Um, anything else from your side before we wrap up? It's a little late nope. over there. All right. Yeah, sounds like great. 11, 11 o'clock almost. Yeah. So, um, you know, of course, as usual, people watching us, you know, if you have any comments, questions, concerns, you want to educate me and Josh a little bit about the, you know, missing pieces, you know, feel free to drop a comment in the comment section. These sessions are not uh, premeditated or staged in any way, shape or form. We're just hanging out and talking about things and somehow from the other side, products come, you know, into existence. So we want to keep it that way. Um, all right. You know, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later. Thank you, Joshua.